Hello, everybody. This is Trip, and uh, it is time for one spectacular conversation. Uh, Adam and I are joined by a mutual friend, uh, uh, a fellow scholar, part of my dissertation committee, and we got to teach a uh, public, uh, public theology class together while I was at Claremont, which was a lot of fun. And uh, one of the smartest people I know, Professor, who's where you're now in Delaware, right? Yep, University of Delaware. Yes, no longer in California. Escaped before Claremont escaped. Um, <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Professor Monica Coleman. So thank you so much for joining us. Ah, I'm glad to be here. It's always a joy to work with Adam and always fun to have to be part of the homebrew community. I get to pop in every couple of years, right? Well, anytime you want. The uh, the doors open. And uh, now uh, we're in the middle of our, our Black Theology reading group. Recently, we read Whitehead together. So I feel like you're the you're the concrescence of both <laughs> reading groups um, in bringing them together. And if people haven't read Making a Way Out of No Way, they need to check it out. But if they're new to Process Thought, they also have a class that you're you're kicking off that um, everyone got in the email. Um, do you want to say a bit about that? Yeah, I've uh, I you know I'm one of those process for the people people. I love process theology. It literally changed my life, my spirituality, my beliefs, and so I have long wanted to share it with other people. And so far, it's just been one of those things that is difficult to learn. You have to go to one of two graduate schools. You might get some exposure if you stumbled into the right college with the right professor. Um, but it was just really a bit inaccessible. And so I wanted to be able to speak regular language and talk about a really relational view of the world and of God. And so I put together a process theology course. Um, most people can find it at processtheology101.com um, that you can take no reading, no homework, no grading, just learning. I mean, which is like the fun part for everybody. Fun for me, fun for everybody else. <laughs> um, and so I've, I'm kind of making that available. So registration is actually closed at the moment, but the homebrew community has a special link, which Tripp has shared with you, that you all can get in. I have a couple coupons for you. And if you're not in the homebrew community, <laughs> go to processtheology101.com and you can get on the wait list and be among the first to know when I open the class again. Awesome. So, so uh, Adam, um, how would you like to kick things off? Because you, you sent me a rather detailed outline of all the amazing topics you wanted to talk to me about. <laughs> and, uh, it's just and, the structure. I want to put some structure because we know we don't have it. Like, usually you want to do the podcast for like, you know, three hours. I don't and know. And just edit it into structure. I don't know if Monica has that type of time. So I said, <laughs> look, out of the three hours, <laughs> here are some issues we should discuss to make everything kind of fit together. Uh, so, you know, we're at a, at a unique historical moment because in 2018, we both, we lost both James Cone and Katie Cannon, mm -hmm. right? Like some yeah. of the patriarchs of our discipline. So that was just two years ago, right? And we're, so we're two years out of a real, um, you know, loss of intellect, of talent, of heart and of soul and of mind. And, um, you know, part of even doing this course is a tribute to Cone, but also to Katie Cannon. And we haven't talked enough about Katie Cannon yet. So I just wanted to start off by just asking Monica about, um, you know, perhaps a little bit about Cannon, about her impact on the discipline of theology and has she, how she's informed your work. And maybe you could start by just a few words about that. I just want you all to know that he didn't tell me this. I would have brought my Kleenex. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, Katie Cannon was a wonderful person, a wonderful teacher, and a wonderful scholar. And, um, you know, she is, you know, one of our original, I guess we would say, one of the first womanist religious scholars. And, you know, to put it in context, um, we're operating out of a liberation theology, which means we believe that context matters when we're doing theology. And the experiences of those who are doing theology probably changes the way theology turns out. 
And that's kind of part of what the postmodern turn brought to Western understandings of religion and society. Um, this was not a new understanding for people who had been left out, but it was a new understanding for you know what had previously been the center. And so black women religious scholars were like, hey, we've been reading feminist theology and it's really great, but we feel like something's missing. It doesn't talk about, doesn't sound like our faith. We're reading black male religious scholars and it's really great and we resonate with a lot, but something's missing. It doesn't sound like our experience. And so they said, we really want to talk about what happens when you bring race and gender and class and for some sexuality together and make black women's religious experiences the center of our religious reflection. And as it turns out, it changes things. <laughs> and so Katie Cannon's work, Black Womanist Ethics, um, and she's an ethicist <laughs> too. What she did that was really became emblematic of womanist religious scholarship was her use of literature as a theological source and as an ethical source. And she looked particularly at the writings of Zora Neale Hurston. But many womanist religious scholars since her <laughs> have really considered the literature written by African American women or women of African descent to be a source, not just for our experience, but also for the way we understand the holy. And you'll see that in much of womanist religious scholarship, whatever the discipline may be. And Katie Cannon really gave us one of the first models for doing so and saying that the ethics that Black women had worked on and had when were implementing were different than the kind of virtue ethics that we heard from Niebuhr and others. Now, I'm not an ethicist, so I need to stop quoting ethicists because <laughs> this might be the end of my knowledge. I've just been on a bunch of ethical dissertations. <laughs> so that's all I can say about virtue ethics. <laughs> but I do know she offered a different kind of virtue ethics that were grounded in the experiences of women who were descendants of the US slavery system. Right, yeah. And she was such a pioneering person just in just creating the whole discipline. She was the first person to actually use the term womanism within theological scholarship, um, right, as an ethicist. And then later, it gets developed by Dolores Williams, who actually uses the term womanist theology formally yeah. later and Jack, on. Yeah, and Jacqueline Grant as well. I mean, they're all around right, the same right, time. They're right, all around yeah. the same institution. Right. Um, right. You know, and draw, using largely Alice Walker's right use invocation of the word womanist. Yeah, well, talk about that. Like, the, how do, how does Alice Walker like define womanism? In, in, I mean, it's really fine. Um, in her book Womanist Prose, which is a collection of essays, well, it's in Search of Our Mother's Gardens: Colon Womanist Prose, um, which are really a collection of essays that Alice Walker wrote throughout the '70s and early '80s, because that book comes out in 1983. Um, she kind of gives this introduction or prologue that is in definition format about what it is to be womanist. And she gives several definitions. And of course, my book is in my office, which I'm not allowed in, but <laughs> I remember well, you know, it talks about womanish, right? And that it's her way of trying to describe Black women's distinct experience, right? She says, womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender, that it loves spirit, loves food, loves roundness, right? is inclusive. And if you read through her essay, she talks about wanting to find a word that felt more like the Black women's experiences she knew, that felt more Southern and more Black compared to the feminism and the feminist waters that she had been working in and writing in previously. And Black women religious scholars, because there aren't a whole bunch of them at this point, remember this, right? We're not talking about a whole lot of people. Yeah. We're like, yes, that's what we mean. This. This describes how we feel bold and audacious and Southern and familial and justice seeking, right? And loving spirit, all these various different things. So many, not all <laughs> black women religious scholars use this term to describe the ways in which they were doing their work. And of course, it's always been a little controversial, <laughs> right? Because Alice Walker isn't Christian. Alice Walker affirms all sexualities and not all religious scholars do, or it did. Um, so it's not that this was a way everybody went, but this was a term that many people invoked as a way to describe the work that they were doing. And people have been in conversation with Alice Walker and she's never been mad about it, right? <laughs> she's very much affirmed, um, you know, and been in conversation with womanist religious scholars in the last years. Wow. Now, now discuss your personal journey to being a womanist and identifying with that term. Well, Adam. 
<laughs> you know, I just to begin, I was I didn't study religion much in undergrad, just to give context. I studied <laughs> African American studies. And so I grew to knew and love and be mentored by people who identified as womanist and by people who identified as black feminist in terms of the black women scholars I looked up to and who I worked with and studied under and who I read. Um, so for me, I was like, I love it all, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can give me bell hooks, <laughs> you can give me Alice Walker. Like I just absolutely loved reading black women's literature, black women's writings, black women's thoughts and ideas. Um, and so as I <laughs> progressed in my journey as a religious scholar, um, I read, of course, more black, I read theology period, because I didn't know between theology, ethics, any of those things. Um, then I went to divinity school and was like, oh, this is cool. Why aren't they telling people about this? <laughs> and read more Black theology, more womanist theology, um, came to know and really love and respect so many of the people in the field. And um, consider it my field, you know, just as I consider myself a process theologian, I consider myself a womanist theologian as part of my dissertation work, part of the work I've done since then. And so um, I can't say if there's a moment you come to a field, right? But you kind of look up and find yourself in it. And I've worked with really, really great, I'm afraid to name names, I know I'm gonna miss somebody, <laughs> you know, but I've gotten the chance to work with Dolores Williams and Karen Baker Fletcher, um, Renita Weems, who's a biblical scholar, not a theologian, but still, <laughs> right? Um, and Dr. Cannon and, you know, so many other people. And this is just kind of in the earlier part of my career who I worked with directly, who I would call women and who called themselves <laughs> womanist religious scholars. And so I think I just felt like this is a field I'm in, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. And as I continued in the field, I saw things that I was like, hey, here are ways we can grow the field in different directions we can move in and things that reflect, you know, my generation's concern or things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And so um, after a while, <laughs> I began to call some of those moves uh, third wave womanist theology. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, because when we were coming up, and we, we talked about this before, there was a big distinction between Black feminists and womanists. Yes. And, and you were part of those debates. And <laughs> so, you know, I was just wondering if you could kind of tell the people, share like what people are identifying with mm -hmm. when they say mm -hmm. Black feminism as opposed to womanism, or, um, yeah. They, <laughs> Those, I mean, it's, yeah. those are not as sharp as they used to be. Yeah, you know, but like when we came, around, we were like, I guess when we were like, young. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't want to say that, but <laughs> no. Yeah, so we were being formed. Like there was a big. I mean, there was a a lot of um, with people had a lot of things invested in those terms, right? And right. They, they're almost like um, sharply contrasted each other in certain ways. Yeah, I think that is true. I felt, um, you know, and I've written about this, right? So this is not a secret. Yeah, what, what, where did you write about this, uh, Monica? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was that essay called? Oh. <laughs> right. Uh, it's called Must I Be Womanist, right? It came out in 2006. I wrote it in 2004. That's how long it took to get to press, just so you all know. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, I think what the sense I had at the time, and I agree, I think it's changed a lot, was that Black feminists didn't do religion that well, right? <laughs> they found religion to be a source of oppression. And let me rephrase that, they didn't do Christianity that well. <laughs> um, and, and, many, and many times eschewed all kinds of discussions of religion and spirituality, uh, and often of Christ and most likely of Christianity. Um, and I thought that was a shortcoming of Black feminism. And I thought that womanism, these are broad strokes, because of course there are exceptions, um, you know, felt pretty insecure about talking about sexuality um, and sexual orientation and sexual difference, <laughs> right? And, um, and talking about religions outside of Christianity. That at that time, womanist religious scholarship really felt very Christian. And it was difficult, again, there were exceptions, <laughs> but when someone wanted to talk about a religious tradition that wasn't Christian, they didn't use the term womanist, they would use the term feminist. And so I kind of wanted to explore what are these differences and how do we begin to name the changes or the growth we hope to see in womanist theology and womanist religious reflection. Um, and 
you know, at the same level, <laughs> Black feminists have permission, you know, like they don't have to be afraid <laughs> so much of religion and of talking about religions. Because I think that in many ways, women has made a lot of strides in talking about gender oppression within religious traditions. Right, yeah. It, it, it seems to be like a lot of, um, I'm thinking about like a lot of people came out of the evangelical community and just in general, now that you're teaching undergrad, you'll see this probably a lot too. There, there's such a hostility just to the term feminism in general. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about just outside the religious context mm -hmm. that there's been such a, let's see, a good kind of beat up job done on the term feminism that it's sometimes, you know, seen as anti-family, uh, male bashing, all these other types of um, you know, labels that when you're teaching like younger people, they grow up and that's the first association they have with it. Um, so, and I, and I say as a preface to say like in terms of your teaching, especially to undergrads, I don't know if you've had the chance to actually even use that term. Like, how do you see people like responding to the term either black feminism and womanism who were born in like the year 2000, they're like 20 years old now. <laughs> and how do they relate to those terms or those set of issues and ideas? You know, I can't say because I haven't taught enough of it to undergrads, these undergrads. When I taught undergrads, they were millennials. Last time I taught, I taught undergrads before being at Delaware. They were millennials, right? <laughs> and so right. Um, it's, it's a whole different generation. Um, you know, I feel comfortable with all the terms. I'm like, feminism, great. Black feminism, great. Womanism, great. <laughs> you know, I like all that they invoke. I love the questioning of power. I love how important self-naming is. I like the feel of them in my mouth. I love the culture criticism. I like it all. And so I feel comfortable in all the waters, so to say. What about at church, when you go to preach at churches? Do people, do you get, what type of reactions do you get when you identify yourself as a womanist or a feminist? Black you suggest I identify myself. <laughs> well, you, you're um, publicly out there. You have books and everything and people read you. No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Um, really, I think that when, you know, if I'm sometimes I'm going to a church to teach about womanist theology, which I have done in churches, okay. but most times I'm going to preach or speak. And so I don't label myself. I just talk about what I'm talking about. And right. I know that it reflects, you know, womanist and feminist and process and, you know, at cultural values. Right. But I'm not naming what I'm doing. I'm just doing yeah. it. <laughs> Because it's interesting because we have a lot of pop, like people are talking about Beyonce as a black feminist and there's like all these debates within these, you know, like black feminism seems to be something that transcends the discipline of theology mm -hmm. and has like a lot of currency just in the general culture as, as well with like popular Indy Irie, Beyonce, other kinds of renderings and that in a way that womanist doesn't seem to have the same type of traction. Even like in Africa, I know you 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 have a uh, you know, um, I wonder even within the the um, the Yoruba tradition, right? Do you see terms in terms of a gender analysis that people identify with womanism or feminism, or how do you? You know, again, I haven't seen preference or one over the other. I mean, I do think the term feminism is more widely known in culture and society than the term womanism. Uh, of course, there are people outside of religion using the term womanism, and there have been for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people inside religious work who are talking about feminism, and there have been for decades, and talking about Black feminism. Um, but I would say, yes, when they talk about Beyonce or other kind of cultural <laughs> figures, people use the term feminism or Black feminism more often. Uh, and I'm like, keep writing people because it gives me stuff to teach, right? So I'm just happy people are writing thought pieces and being critical and giving analysis because I teach it all. Um, <laughs> even though I'm not writing it, I, I love it. Um, but I think, you know, my experience is most people within whatever you're doing, right? If you're the artist, if you're the practitioner, you're not putting a label on it. You're just doing whatever the it is. Oh, analysis, so it doesn't make it. Okay, yeah. But, okay, so, you know, also, I, I guess another thing in terms of looking at the term or sexism and patriarchy as an analytical category, right? Mm -hmm. There is a big distinction between the way white feminists use that term and the way black feminists and women mm -hmm. use that term, right? And I wonder if you could kind of tease out how that's being used in terms of... Well, 
you know, I think when, you know, in the 80s, right, in early, late 80s, early 90s, when um, the first womanist religious scholars were writing, there was probably a bigger distinction than I see in most people's work now, right? And mm -hmm. that is that, you know, feminism really did seem to reflect middle class white women's values coming out of the 70s. And well, womanist critique was like, hey, wait, that's just some women. That's not all women. That doesn't include Black women, right? And Mujahista said the same thing, right? And Asian feminist religious scholars said the same thing. Um, and I do feel like a lot of white feminist scholars heard that and have been much more uh, inclusive in their work since then or have noted kind of where their social location is coming from and what they're speaking about and not attempted to speak for all women. And so I think that, you know, the critique was made and heard in a lot of ways. And that's exactly what you hope to happen and what you would like to happen when you issue a critique. Um, but I think what Blackamore is saying is that when, when we experience sexism, it's tangled up <laughs> with sexism and racism and often classism, right? And all other types of isms, <laughs> right? And um, that wasn't reflected in a lot of the work of white feminists. Yeah. Um, and to name patriarchy as the only thing we're fighting. Well, like, no, we're fighting a whole bunch of things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Patriarchy and white supremacy and, you know, heteronormativity and, right, the ills of capitalism, et cetera. Right. Yeah. You know, I see that now in the, the Black Lives Matter movement where you have Black Lives Matter, then you have, which is a Black theological priority, and it has been, but the all black lives, right, mm -hmm. seems to be a womanist kind of insistence on the inclusiveness of black lives, right? That right, black right. lives is not some type of androcentric norm. Yeah. Well, really, yeah, and saying, you know, the Say Her Name campaigns that are really yeah, super important right. to say, you know, we've got to remember all the black women and the black trans women who are dying too, and yet, we have more campaigns around Black men's lives sometimes than Black women's lives. And so there's that patriarchy even within our, our look at um, the problems of white supremacy and saying, hey, hey, no, no, not OK. We're not doing that anymore, people. You know, we're not choosing race over gender. We're, everybody needs to be heard and yeah. everyone needs to matter. Uh, and even within our own communities, our own racial or cultural communities, you know, women still are experiencing that kind of patriarchy and we're not here for it. Right, right, right. And now, a minute ago, you talked about um, literature as a, as a resource mm -hmm. for womanist theology. And I know you've been doing a lot of work this summer <laughs> with Octavia Butler. I know you've done work with, uh, you know, you know a lot about Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm just wondering how those two, you know, well, first, just in general, how, how literature is used by womanists, I guess, as a kind of a, just a broad category in terms of as a distinctive, distinct from other theological traditions and how you, your use of Octavia Butler, I'll, let's, let's kind of stay there because I think you've been doing, you've been very active this summer with that. You know, how that informs your perspective on womanism and how woman is, how you understand Octavia Butler. And maybe, but who is she for people who don't, are unfamiliar with her work? Um, I think I love this question because Black women's literature is my first love. Like this is what I was reading as a kid, right? And growing up and in high school and why I majored in African American studies in college was like, give me more Black women's literature. Um, and I got into Octavia Butler. I can't even remember when. Um, I think because I was someone said, one teacher said I would like science fiction and I didn't <laughs> because I was reading like Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov and was just not connecting with it. And like so many young people, when you don't see yourself reflected in what you read, you don't find it particularly interesting. And so I ended up with Octavia Butler and just inhaled her work. The Pattern Master series, the Xenogenesis series, the Parable series, other books that she had. And I think I just happened to be reading her when I was working on my doctoral work and was like, wow, I see process theology everywhere. Uh, I wonder if anyone's ever thought of this. And so Octavia Butler is this, you know, iconic um, and talented Black female science fiction writer. We now use the term Afrofuturism, but no one said Afrofuturist back then. <laughs> you just kind of said Black science fiction writer. And 
She's written so many books and the Parable series, Parable the Sower, Parable of the Talents, um, series that she wrote just is wonderfully religious because you have this young black girl basically constructing theology in the midst of just political chaos, not so different from where we are now. And it's a, I love teaching it. I've taught it for years. And most people who've been in my classes at various institutions have read Parable the Sower with me uh, because it's such a good model for constructive theology. And I love having a teenage black girl heroine <laughs> and, you know, I, savior even, I argue, in my work. Um, so that's how I've loved Octavia Butler's work in terms of looking at what does it mean for change to be the center of how we understand the world, which is what she does. She says, God has changed. Everything has changed, right? Uh, um, and I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, this is what process is. So that was really where I first geeked out about it. But in terms of how womanists have used, womanist theologians and womanist ethicists, um, I can speak of a little bit, have used mm. Black women's literature. I think they've used it in a couple ways. Um, you know, we have these kind of classical sources for constructing theology. Now, I'm Wesleyan, so I'll use Wesleyan language for that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Scripture, <laughs> tradition, experience, and um, scripture, tradition. I'm not forgetting one. Reason. Reason. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and if you're a little too licky and you would add culture, although I kind of put culture under experience. Yeah. Um, so we have these kind of classic sources for doing theology. And I think that many womanists have used Black women's literature as a way of talking about our experiences and saying, hey, these are talking about what our experiences are. Um, I think my use of Butler's work is more like scripture, actually. <laughs> I take um, these books as ways that point us toward that which is holy, that which is sacred, which is what I think scripture does. Um, I very much believe in the open canon, as I know many womanist theologians do. They might not believe it's as open as I think it is, <laughs> but none of us think that God talked in the Bible and stopped, right? <laughs> we all think that there's a lot of holiness and a lot of God to be found outside of what we have in, you know, a canonized Protestant or Catholic Bible. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think that Black women's literature also kind of points us towards that which is holy. I call that scripture. Not everybody would com be comfortable calling that scripture, I but know. I call that using Butler's work as scripture and seeing it as a way, just like we use with our holy named holy text of our tradition, a way of telling us what God's up to, a way of telling us how God shows up in the world, and hopefully as a guide for how we can live out our callings in the world. Mm. Now, Dr. Coleman, you've been accused of introducing Alfred North Whitehead as a source for women's theology. Guilty or not guilty? Totally guilty. <laughs> okay, well, I would say that's a white one man reason. be a that's theological source? Can, can a white man be a theological source for women's theology? You know, I had this I will say I had this conversation with a leading womanist theologian at a certain dissertation defense and of mine. And you know, I say, you know, you, you use you use what sources you find helpful. Right. Uh -huh. And some people find Tillich helpful. Um, Dr. Cohn found Barb helpful when he was beginning, right? I find Whitehead helpful. I'm also clear that Whitehead didn't invent process theology, right? That there are very long and ancient traditions of understanding change as the foundation of what occurs in the world and with God. I like the way Whitehead puts it together. And I'm not uncritical of Whitehead. I'm like, well, Whitehead missed it here. <laughs> Whitehead got it wrong there. You know, it's an open metaphysic. And so we, I, I tweak it, I change it as it needs to be, which is what Whitehead intended. Um, but yeah, I do use Whitehead in, in terms of as a way in which I understand how the world works. So that would be the reason section of my theological sources. And so I am a process theologian and I'm a womanist theologian, yes. Okay, so, it, so the category of experience, you said you put culture under experience. Now, yeah. how, would, how would a white heavyian or a process person look at the category of experience in similar ways or different ways that you just kind of rendered it? I think in very similar ways, actually. You know, um, process theology has a lot of empirical roots, if we're going to talk nerdy, right? A lot of roots in American pragmatism with like James and Dewey, a lot of roots with British empiricists. And so um, those who follow the Whiteheadian tradition of process thought are very clear that we start in experience, we theorize, and we end in experience. 
an experience is the beginning and the test of how we do <laughs> theological reflection. And for a woman, the woman a theologian, I center Black women's religious experiences. And that's a pretty broad <laughs> thing to say, right? Because define Black, define woman, define religious, define experience, right? There, it's a broad category. But I begin somewhere <laughs> in Black women's religious experiences. And I try to theorize, and then I try to land again in Black women's religious experiences. So I would say they're quite consonant, actually, in terms of really seriously considering context and how that matters. I think I'm very, maybe I'm not very clear in my writing, but I definitely think that just because I began with Black women's experiences doesn't mean I don't think it's true for everybody. <laughs> Because that's the process part of me, where I'm like, oh no, this is how everything works. I'm just starting with Black women's experiences because I, that's what I center. That's what that's what matters to me. But I don't think that what I'm saying usually is only true for Black women. I just think it's important for us to look at Black women's experiences and start with Black women's experiences okay. when I'm doing womanist work. Wow. Okay. So how did the process <laughs> perspective? well, your process perspective, I should say, specifically, look at the issue of Christian identity, because you've been accused of beating up Trip Fuller over his Christian identity. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, is, first of all, is that a woman's priority to beat up Trip Fuller over his Christian identity? And also, how do you understand, and how do you, how, because you are, you know, you, you have a lot of work out on religious pluralism. So I'm just wondering, in terms of looking at Christian identity specifically as one dimension of that kind of pluralistic <laughs> thing, like how do you, like, you know, how does womanism help you interpret? It? Well, let me backtrack. When we talked about COVID earlier, we talked about the, the, the relationship between being Black and Christian, mm -hmm. right? So the Blackness as going to experience and the Christian identity as, look, as, as being read through that. I'm wondering how womanism helps you read or a process womanism helps you reread Christian identity. Um, well, to begin with, I have never beat up on Trent for not <laughs> <with Christian identity. laughs> giving He's giving Trip a hard time. Um, no, Trip is a, a good scholar, a great thinker, an excellent public theologian. And, you know. And he's, and he's, and he's sufficiently Christian or he's overdeterminedly Christian? I mean, I don't make those assessments. <laughs> I, I want you to know that this is a this is the longest I have not talked on any homebrew thing ever, and <laughs> and and I got distracted. I just got a text like, "Have you ever not talked for forty minutes?" And I was enjoying it so much that I just like, well, "I'm gonna no no no, this is fun." Um, but I, I will quickly answer the question, right? I think <laughs> no, no, no. I wasn't meaning to say oh, no, something. No, I was no, only no. wanting to. I was only saying it to go like, don't distract, don't distract. I was having fun. If you bring me into it, I'm going to talk too much. <laughs> um, no, so but aside from Tripp's Christian identity, you know there are so many <laughs> Christian process theologians, right? You know, um, it's like I was jokingly telling a friend on social media. Like most process Christologies are high, mine just isn't, right? So there are varieties within the way people do process theology too, of course, like any other school of theology, one would expect that. And so, you know, process offers a worldview and we believe that everyone operates off a worldview. We're just telling you what our worldview is, right? So people in the Bible operated off a worldview that the earth was flat and heaven was up here and Sheol was down here because that's what they knew, right? And so we, everyone operates off a world view. Um, and you usually don't state it because everyone else around you has the same world view as well. And just like, you know, the kind of Greek and Roman community of the first and second centuries, they had a world view about what was important, mind over spirit, you know, back, you know, and over body as an example. And we just say that our worldview is about change. <laughs> our worldview is about process, about things always transforming. And whatever religious tradition you are, you can be that religious tradition with a process worldview, with a worldview that centers change. And so that's probably the best way of putting it about can one be a process Christian? Well, of course, if you're, you know, you can. And you could be a Christian and not have a process worldview either because there are plenty of people who I know and love, right, <laughs> who, who don't. It, they don't go together necessarily. But yes, I do work in religious pluralism, which is simply the belief that 
all religions are fine, right? That just because you're not in the religious tradition I'm in doesn't mean that you are condemned or something bad is going to happen to you or God doesn't love you, right? That's all it means, right? When you affirm religious pluralism. So I affirm the validity of re different religious traditions. And I write about how we think about that, how we talk about that and what that means. And because not all black women are Christian, right? <laughs> you know, then part of what we do as womanist religious scholars, what we can do is write from non-Christian perspectives or write about more than one religion. And so I do that as well. Well, in the womanist, in, in, well, the black tradition, lift every voice. Trip, we have to lift your voice up because people are wondering why you're mute. So, so. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure there's a million hours of me saying things. Um, the, you know, the, one, the one question that popped in my head is um, you mentioned how womanist theology it, it uh, uh, tends to experience in a different way because it's a, a type of situated one and among womanist theologians you not only use literature you use your own experience and so like when you and share it in ways that make other theologians uncomfortable right like uh, one of the moments in my when when we were in a public scholarship class when you were writing bipolar faith um uh, you were answering someone else's question, and that's when I realized how much of my own experience I was more than happy to use in pastoral context and not in a theological one, mm -hmm. where you said, well, here's what I'm wrestling with right now and trying to figure out how to tell this story, and blah, blah, like, and you, you're like ascribing it, and I just thought to myself, no, 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 we're talking about doing theology in my head, and, and so I, I'm interested how, um, n how, one, how you came to think of the theological endeavor uh, in, in a way where your own experience, the experience that's described in, uh, in, in uh, a multiplicity of communities, right? Like working with the community of, of women who've experienced domestic abuse has shaped your work. Like there's so many places where you attend to the experience, but their experience is treated as sacred, right? In the way that you're expanding the sacred text. Uh, how did you cultivate that hermeneutic of experience uh, to be kind of the, the theological uh, scribe to these sacred encounters? Uh, well, I guess first I want to say I'm not the first to do it because this is what Augustine does in Confessions, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, to offer up your own spiritual journey for theological reflection is kind of, is, is in many ways what theologians have been doing for a long time. Some have been more direct about that <laughs> than others. Some have been, you know, mystics do the same thing in their mystical writings and their poetry. Like this is my spiritual experience, my spiritual journey. You know, I also studied theology with Sally McFaig and who you've interviewed and who you know, did a lot with spiritual autobiography. And so that, you know, really seeped into the way in which I think about theology, I think. This um, fearlessness <laughs> and describing my own social location and putting myself in my work. Um, not that I was always trained to do that, but I think also, um, and this is a little bit funny, but I was trying to sell the book, right? And so when I was, you know, working on, you know, making a way out of no way and getting it published, you know, process theology was really known for being this field that nobody understood and nobody wanted to publish it. And then I was like, why, why don't I explain to these publishers why this matters to me and why I think this is important and why other people will care. And when I did, that's what we got, <laughs> right? And they're like, oh, okay, we can do that. And so I think that's just something that works better for me to kind of say, this is why I'm excited about it. This is why I think it's important. This is why it matters to me, to the communities that I'm invested in, the communities I care about. And this is why I think it will matter to you. I mean, that's, that's just the way I think of it. And so that's the way I try to tell the story. Yeah. No, and when, you, oh, when you go to a, when you are thinking through an experience as something to take it or, or to take an experience theologically, uh, how do you, um, uh, or what changes when you decide to take an experience theologically? or to take a community's experience, or to take a piece of art uh, seriously theologically. A number of questions that came in uh, mm -hmm. had to do, and I'm seeing them on a number of the different social feeds right now, mm -hmm. have to do with one, how, 
questions either about scripture, right? Like, oh, she's trying to expand scripture. But also, you're affirming other experiences, which is something people are wrestling with and wanting to do. So as the theologian or the person of faith thinking about life, um, how do you attend to uh, text and tradition in ways to recognize the divinity that is, um, you know, that comes out of it or is present within it or however you want to put it? And how do you do the same in uh, lived experience? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> so <laughs> where does experience matter for me? You know, if we w had a, a Wesleyan quadrilateral or a Methodist quadrilateral, it's the longest side, right? Which is not what Wesley did. Wesley was like, scripture is the longest side. Um, but for me, I say experience is the longest side. It's where I start, where I mm -hmm. end. Yeah. Um, and not just my personal experience, right? But the experiences of, of others, not everybody, because you only got a book amount to write <laughs> or an article amount to write. Um, but what experiences are lifted up, what's shown, right? You know, I talked about Octavia Butler earlier, but I've also written about Tanana Reed Dew's work. I've written about Nalo Hopkinson's work. And these are books of fiction, right? Of science fiction, which to me are prophetic literature. And the, not prophetic like telling the future, but prophetic like critiquing the social order and warning us if we don't go, <laughs> if we don't get it together, this is where we're gonna be, or this is where it looks like we're moving, right? And which is even what you see happen in biblical literature, press prophetic, it's the same thing. So I would put in the same kind of genre. And so for me, I'm looking at these worlds and looking at what's happening and saying, wow, what is it saying about God? What is it saying about how we operate? What is it saying about our spirituality? And let's look at this and let's play with it and let's go somewhere with it. Um, but how does that in work with scripture? Well, I think everyone looks at scripture differently, not everybody, but many different traditions. Um, in fact, this is kind of a big piece about womanist theology too, was that we're all reading the same Bible, but we're looking at different things as being important. And so for many black theologians, as you probably have been talking about, you know, the Exodus story rose to center or Luke four rose to the center as like, hey, this is how we know God is, <clears throat> you know, against oppression. And Dolores Williams comes in and says, hey, the Hagar story might be a better story for us to lift up. This might be more emblematic of Black women's experiences. And so it's not about not liking scripture. It's about where do we focus on scripture? And everybody does this. A little, this is how we have the different denominations, right? That we focus on different parts of scripture as being more formative for us than other parts of scriptures. But we're all looking at the same Bible if you're in a Christian tradition. Right. So for me, <laughs> you know, I love how Dolores Williams does that. And I am also looking at other texts that are not in, again, a Catholic or Protestant Bible. But it doesn't mean I ignore what's in the Bible because this is what I get about Jesus. This is the first way I came to know God. Right. Um, because I was raised Christian. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you something. I, I, I should ask you this earlier, but I think you were the first person to do this. But as there are different waves of feminism, <laughs> You talk about, you've mentioned third wave womanism a few times, and I'm wondering if you could just explain to the people that, you know, how you're seeing first, second, and third wave, like give a, have a brief description of how you're understanding the different generations and the perspective, perspective of women as authors, um, in terms sure. of how you use that term. <laughs> sure. Um, I prefer the term waves compared to generations because I don't think it's about age necessarily. Right. Um, so the first wave are the first people, right? the first people in the fields to begin to center Black women's religious experiences. And in some fields, that's still happening, right? It's not like Black yeah. women have been getting PhDs in religion for like 200 years, right? It's, right? So, you know, the first people, to, the first two, three, four in the field to say, hey, we're going to center Black women's religious experiences and we're going to get something different than what was than what happened before we did that. So I think of that as the first wave. Mm -hmm. um, I think of the second wave as those who come, you know, who follow in that tradition and extend that work, right? And who are saying, well, let's do more of that and let's keep asking these questions and let's continue to lift up um, this first wave and, um, and explore more because we're not talking about a lot of people. So it's a lot of work that still has to be done. We don't have centuries and centuries of writing about Black women at the center of theological reflection, at least not in the Western world. And so a second wave is those who are doing that. And a third wave I talk about is those who emerge from this tradition and then kind of break from it. 
right? Who break left, you might say, <laughs> or break right, um, and begin to push the questions about what it, you know, push the assumptions that have existed before. So what do we mean when we say black? What do you mean when we say woman? What do we mean, you know, who trouble those waters? What do we mean when we say um, religious, who are working with many religious traditions or non-Christian religious traditions, who are really pushing ideas about assumptions about gender and sexuality and politics and those kinds of things, but who still see themselves very firmly grounded in a womanist tradition and centering Black women's religious experiences in caring about justice and survival and quality of life as the telos of the work. Um, I also try to shift the idea from thinking about people <laughs> to thinking about the work, right? So that it's less who's doing the work and what is the work itself doing. Um, so if I write something that's just a total nerd out white headian piece, which I have done, right? It's not a piece of womanist work. It just isn't. <laughs> there's not anything about black women in it, yeah. right? <laughs> and but then there's work I might write that would be womanist work because I am talking about black, black women's religious experiences. Um, you could be a man or a non-black woman, but if you're centering black women's religious experiences, then I might call that third wave womanist work. So I try to make it more about the ideology of what's happening in the work than the identity of who is doing the work, and that's also a bit of a shift. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting because, okay, so let me ask you this specifically because you said something that has been a controversy within womanism for a long time. Mm -hmm. And can people who are not Black women be womanists? I think people who are not Black women can produce work that centers the religious experiences of Black women and encourages a telos of survival, quality of life, and justice. And I would say that work is womanist. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because but not I, everyone agrees with me. <laughs> that's just right. not so where that I would be a third. So that's third wave. That's third what you wave. Mean. Yeah. As opposed to some of the many of the the um, initial framers of womanism, right? Like saw it as exclusively for Black women. And some people still do. Right. 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 And I understand that too. It's like, hey, this is ours. Why does everyone else get to have our stuff? I'm like, I, I hear you. You know. I mean, I think they're just two different perspectives. One's not more right than another. Okay. Okay. So that it's, it's kind of, that's what you meant by unsettled category in terms of that, like pushing the boundaries of it. Right. Okay. Cause this, this discipline just for people who are listening is less than 50 years old right. as an academic discipline. Right. Right. So we're still like sitting there and having contestation and debate and revising categories all the time. And that's what any type of rigorous discipline is doing. So I just want people to understand that. Versus, and even the idea of historical retrieval, like, you know, what do you think of all the, you know, people have been going back to Harriet Tubman, and a lot of kind of, I guess, what you call proto-womanists. Right. So really, like, how do you, you know, what do you think about in terms of people um, going back and retrieving, you know, what Black women have made great contributions to society in terms of that, and how do you, you know, it, let me stick with Harriet Tubman because she, they made a motion picture about her. <laughs> Which she's I still haven't seen. 20... Oh, you haven't seen it? I haven't. Okay. And she's supposed to be on the twenty dollar bill, right? right? So she's becoming part of this kind of pantheon. Mm -hmm. Of and I, and I was just wondering if you had any comments to say about how she her her image is being used in the American public or any other. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> I would say you know to speak of the proto womanist conversation, you know, on the one side there are those who say. If they didn't call themselves womanists, and you had the same thing with proto-feminists, right? They didn't use that language, then we can't call themselves that. And others that would say, you know, but we see all these values and ideals in these historical figures, and we have later given a name to that. And I think I err more on this side, right? To say, sure, if we, if we in the 80s named something about certain values and ideals, and we see this in people well before 1980-something, then why not? what does it matter, right? <laughs> Except to say that we come from a long tradition of badass Black women. Well, yeah. Can I say that? Oh, anyway, I did. Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, Trent Fuller, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right, to say the Black women have long been badass and here we are too. Well, yeah, let's say that. <laughs> Trent, you look like you want the, to get it. Well, no, I was just, I've, I've been grading dissertations or master's dissertations this week. And one was on, um, uh, it, it was an argument for progressive Christian sainting. And oh, wow. the whole, er, like, wow. 
process of identifying someone as a saint. I mean, yes, there's like the, oh, the miracle part, but the other parts were that in this telling, honest telling of a person's life, an expression of the divine uh, is revealed. And so I, I think that really resonates with the way you're talking about looking at the past. And, um, and, and when, when I started to do that, I, in that context, there are so many other lives then, right? Like, as opposed to, can they meet every expectation we have in our present for whatever we have? And will we ever meet those for our grandkids? We hope not, because they'll hopefully be more mature than us. But can you say, like, in their context of their life, you can give a rendering of their life where the holy and divine and justice and stuff come through. And then, like, when we make them a saint, it's they're dead. But we can tell their story where it's an opening to the divine. Uh, anyway, that's what I was hearing when you said that. I could totally process nerd on that. But, I know. <laughs> I mean, one is, you know, that, of course, every life has got in it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the hard part. And to say that the presence of divine and holiness means that you're flawless. Well, that doesn't work, right? So to look for a flawless life is not the idea. But I think it's that what, what Catholics have called sainthood, right? Mm -hmm you know, others have called cultural heroes, right? That these are the people who we lift up, whether it's Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman, and this is really what Orisha are <laughs> in traditional Yoruba religion. They're cultural heroes, and this mm -hmm. is why they're said to be 401 of them, right? Which is a way of saying a whole bunch, right? It's not exactly 401. It's, you know, a, a, a way of invoking that there's so many and it's not about were you perfect were you flawless but you know do we see the divine lifting up in you in an archetypal way that that we still hold on to and that we seek to emulate and we seek to invoke and whose stories we seek to tell so we can learn more and more about how god shows up in the world wow that's that's great so um i was i was sent two different emails reminding me that Adam and I said, well, we should just talk about that when Monica's on earlier. So <laughs> Adam dodged questions and topics saying it'd be better. So these, I will ask the questions and then you two talk to each other. So how about that way uh, okay, okay. we make sure we get to them. I can't even remember what those questions were. But okay. right, well, like something you would do, Adam. I'm basically, I, I'm, I'm just trusting the message. All right. So they said, in week one, we were discussing the relationship of African traditional religion and the tension of rereading the slaveholders' religion and how that figures to thinking about being multiply religious and whether or not Christianity is the white man's religion. And we, they, we started to say something followed by, actually, this would be a lot more fun when Monica's on, so we should talk about that then. So this is just me like throwing the ball up to go one, you might want to say some more about African traditional religion, but then is Christianity a white man's religion? How is it not? That kind of thing. Yeah. Go ahead, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, is Christianity a white man's religion? No. I mean, just at the end of the day, right? You have Coptic Christians, Ethiopic Christians that, you know, really predate Christianity going into Europe, right? It's a Semitic tradition emerging, right, from, um, you know, from North Africa, period, right? From this is the section of the world it comes from with many resonances with how North Africans understood the world and understood religion. Um, so is Christianity a white man's religion? No. Um, the way in which many African Americans who are descendants of the U.S. slavery system were introduced <laughs> into slave to Christianity was, you know, in a, was from white slaveholders, right? And those who were invested in that system, which we know is oppressive. And what is remarkable <laughs> is how often um, Christianity was used to oppress and African Americans spun it, <laughs> you know, and interpreted it and adapted it and, you know, interpreted Christianity in a way that still reflected their culture, their values and their freedom, right? Our culture, our values and freedom. And so, um, that's why African American Christianity or African American religions is kind of its own thing. 
and why even I remember saying this when I went when I worked with World Council of Churches you know in the U.S. a white Baptist church and a black Baptist church will look more different than a black Baptist church and a black Methodist church right because that's how pervasive <laughs> and salient culture is in the ways in which we um, express our Christianities here so to answer that question <laughs> no I don't think you know, at face value, Christianity is a white man's or white person's religion. Um, but there was another question about being multiply religious. Can you tell me more about that? Oh, well, about the relationship of African traditional religion, um, because it came up in the conversation of uh, where, where Malcolm X talks about uh, the, mm -hmm. the way the introduction of Christianity comes where you, you're cut off in a lot of ways from the cultural, religious, spiritual heritage of African traditional religion. Um, and, and so when you get into the place of, uh, of having more autonomy within the state, you have some that go back to Africa and that kind of third uh, kind of historical relationship to Africa as missionaries, right? Like where they're using slavery as a justification for spreading Christianity and stuff um, and and wanting to resist that but also you have and you and some other Claremont students all pointed out the way in which African traditional religions exist alongside Christianity in the black church in ways that Europeans are just Puritan and Puritanical about our, our religious expressions and so uh, like how to how how is someone who spends time introducing African traditional religion then talk about the way African traditional religion uh, comes into new expressions in uh, you know, in North America and through uh, the forced migration and everything? Monica, they read they read um, Gabriel Wilmer's African ah. that that chapter, so I think it's coming out of that. Okay, uh, I mean, you know, we teach entire classes on this, <laughs> so to give the short, <laughs> to give the short version, right? I mean, it has long been a topic of debate within Black studies of how much of our Africanness was retained or lost in the experience of U.S. enslavement, right? So, and that's just it's a huge debate, right? We kind of um, typify it with Herskovitz and Fraser, but it's just an ongoing debate, and. Who knows who's right? <laughs> you know, people take kind of positions on it, and I have my own position, but there isn't a right answer to that question. Um, what we can say, though, of course, is that African traditional religions are part of African cultures. Uh, I just heard a wonderful lecture by Jacob Alubita, who I love, who's at Harvard, um, giving um, online, because it was in the spring, <laughs> about um, how much of African traditional religions are really interwoven into many African cultures, even if people don't espouse that religious tradition. Um, but let's look at those who do, right? That part of it is that, and this is what I said in the book I'm working on now, right? Is that African-American religions have always been plural, right? The first Muslims in the US were enslaved Africans who were Muslim, <laughs> which is not the face of Islam that we often see in media, but that's, the historic case and that most of the Muslims in the U.S. are African-American. And so it's not like there's just Black Christianity and there you go. <laughs> and then all of a sudden people have discovered Africa. Like, no, it's always been a kind of complex, some use the term secretism, but, you know, mixture, for lack of a better word, of Islam <laughs> that enslaved Africans brought with them, of traditional African cultural beliefs and religious beliefs and practices. And a Protestant Christianity or a Catholic Christian, depending on where you were in the US. And how that manifested largely depended on geography, right? Because if you're working with Catholicism, it looks a little different than if you're working with Baptist, you know, Baptist and Methodist um, religious expressions. Um, but it shows up in worship, <laughs> it shows up in music, right? It shows up in so many ways that we can see kind of this is what makes it, what makes black whatever look a little different than the non-black version <laughs> of whatever. It's all the culture that we're bringing. Um, and of course, there are people who were very intentional about their, um, I guess, adherence to African traditional religious practices and African traditional religious beliefs. 
Um, some who always have been that and some who said, hey, I do feel like this religion is not for me because of how it feels about gender or race or sexuality or a number of things, right? That this is not my original religion. Um, and I want to <laughs> practice intentionally only in African traditional religion. Yeah, I think a lot of this gets down to different types of readings of, of, of Christianity. And the, uh, the Black experience has offered a number of different readings. Like, how do you read Christianity against itself, right, mm -hmm. in terms of that? Um, or hitting a straight lick with a crooked stick, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Audre Lorde, I guess, you know, raised the question, can you use the master's tools to dismantle the master's? <laughs> right and right been, look we've used crooked sticks to hit a straight lick right we, we, we we've used that before that's kind of our tradition in terms of doing that so it's kind of reading it's it's really a rereading of the tradition and, and some people like Howard Thurman have, have talked about how African Americans have redeemed the Christian tradition <laughs> by making it not the religion of the slaveholder yeah. making it a religion of freedom yeah. and that's what black Christianity does as, as at its best yeah. right as highest it does that it redeems the faith to make it more authentic to itself to make it true to what it said on paper mm -hmm. right and not have all these type of contradictions and hypocrisies now the, the question like they think womanist um point out is on issues of gender mm -hmm. like black people have been very very good at rereading against race but not as good about reading, reading against gender. We could see this when we talk about same-sex marriage and things like that, about how you're reading scripture. And people like Kelly Brown Douglas has always pointed out that, look, how are you liberative on all these readings on race where it says, slaves be obedient to your masters. Mm -hmm. Yes, you say this is a document of freedom, but then you read all these oppressive sexual passages and you say, no, that's the word of God. <laughs> right, right. Right? So a lot of it has to do with hermeneutics or how we're interpreting scripture. Mm -hmm. If he calls for a broader um, reading and to go to actually the God of love, the God of justice, the God of liberation, to actually look at the text itself in light of that, instead of just woodenly applying scripture to people's situation. Yes, exactly. I mean, I think you mentioned using Wilmore. What I love about Wilmore is he's like, this is where I start. I'm starting with African religions. And, you know, that's what liberation theology says is it matters where you start. right? Um, and as, that's why I think it's so valuable, not, you know, that Wilmore chooses to start there because you might get something different depending on where you start. And, you know, as you're mentioning about uh, Kelly Brown Douglas's interpretation and her, even her early work is like the Black Christ. She's saying, you know, one interpretation of oppression, this is the interpretation the same, whether you're oppressing on race or religion or gender or sexuality. Um, and which makes perfect sense. Why don't people get this, right? <laughs> that is not like, oh, we're not okay with these oppressions, but these oppressions are okay. No, 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 <laughs> none of them are okay. And it's the same logic that's used, just a different object of oppression. And, you know, she and many others have pushed to say, no, what we're against is this whole logic of oppression. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one question that came in a couple different ways was, about how process relates to womanism around um, uh, eschatological hope. And, uh, and, and, you know, one of them came in the kind of like normal evangelical or even, even open theist criticisms to process where if you don't have like divine intervention and stuff, how do you get eschatological hope? And others versions of the questions were, uh, um, how do you have ultimately have a God of justice if all you can manage to say sometimes is that God suffers with you and isn't going to end up doing anything about it. So um, how do you, be, kind of where do you begin on that? Since we don't have a whole lot of times, but uh, you can also refer them to a wonderful book that explores these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I would say that liberation theologians are very much concerned with trying to get heaven here on earth, right? and are very much against the idea, of, let's wait till we get to heaven for everything to be okay. Like, no, 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 that's never worked well for us, right? And so part of what we're called to do for the, you know, again, the theology nerds is to focus on the already part of eschatology and not just or not as much on the not yet. 
And how do we, you know, try and get as much of the vision of heaven on earth? And that vision isn't just like streets paved with gold. That's a vision of justice and community and wellness and quality of life and adventure, right? And art and beauty and truth and so many things, right? And that what we're all aiming for, right, is to have as much of that, you know, realized in the temporal world, to use process language right here on earth, as possible. And God's not just like, oh, wow, yeah, that'd be cool. You know, hope it goes well for you. Like, no, that's not cool. <laughs> like, and I, you know, the way I understand process and the way I think many liberation theologians understand God's activity, even if we have different visions of God, is that God is calling us to that vision. And God is calling us to do the work on our side to do as much as we can to have that vision happen. And I think we have hope because sometimes we see it. Like a lot of times we don't, but sometimes we do. And it is because we do see it and because there are people in glimpses and communities that are living out this beatific vision, right? This vast array of vision on earth. Do we say, hey, if it can be done there, we can do it again. We can make it broader. We can make it bigger. And for most, that is a calling. It is not something like we do alone, but we do empowered by spirit. Am I supposed to take a shot at that question? Or is that because yeah, 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 no, or you can ask the last question, whatever you, whatever you want. I don't want to. Uh, oh, you can okay. go well, wherever you want, Adam. Oh no, uh, stick with the people. I was gonna go. I was gonna go in a different direction, but stick with the uh, the um, the questions that people are asking from the course. Yeah. Oh, well, all right. So the the last question, but you both have to answer this. Um, uh, I feel awkward asking this question, but I'm very new at this. If you're learning to listen, but you have been thoroughly indoctrinated into Eurocentric theology, but just called it Christianity, what are the most frequent differences? If I learn to listen well, I'll notice. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And I think that's a playoff because because uh, Grace, in the conversation with uh, – Jesse Jackson talked about the way Eurocentric uh, Christianity gets passed off as just systematic theology. And then <laughs> on occasion, you can have electives with uh, contextual ones. <laughs> That's why I like it when I get to teach systematics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, I guess it's like listening to something. I think the the symptom of when you really start listening is you feel strange, like it'll feel odd to you because really hearing someone for the first time, especially a voice of anguish and a voice of, uh, it, 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 it will feel, you'll feel odd. It just won't be routine anymore. Like listening to new voices makes you reconsider yourself, right? So I think that's the first, the discomfort, maybe disconcerted, maybe that's the way, to be unsettled, right? When people heard the gospel, knew for the first time, it was unsettling. It, it was, there was disbelief, it was incredulous. Like, what, this is what you're telling me? And I think by people who are in privileged positions, listening to the voice of the, the oppressed or the marginalized, I think this, a similar thing happens, right? There's an incredulousness, there's a unsettledness, there's it's disconcerting. So I don't think there's like a certain harmony at first, right? I think the harmony is, is heart is, is one down the road, right? But I think the first thing, it, there's discord, right? And you have to sit with that and be in dialogue with that for quite a while before it becomes like something that you could really integrate into your life. So I think the first thing is like a thorn in the flesh, to use a Pauline analogy. And then after, and then, you know, as you sit with that for a while, maybe there becomes some type of soothing or acceptance. But I think that's, people go too easy to that, right? Like we have a, we have a, we have an Easter Sunday Christianity and not a Good Friday Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. And I think people skip over Good Friday, go right to Easter. That's a good way of putting it, Adam. <laughs> I think the first thing I thought of was how the, 19th century Black woman scholar Anna Julia Cooper says, when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me. Mm -hmm. And part of it is to bring everyone in the room with you when you're listening, 
right? So bring in your friend who lost their job. Bring in your friend who's a different race or a different gender than you are and say, how does this sound to their ears? <laughs> how does this sound to their experience? You know, bring in your friend who lost a child for no reason at a young age, right? Bring in you bring in your people with you. When you enter, bring in the voices of those you know and love. And if you have a relatively homogenous friend group, <laughs> bring in the voices of those you know exist in the world and say, how would they hear this? How would this sound to them? If I, put, if I ask one more question of what I'm hearing, does it take me down a route that is more oppressive or more liberating? Right? Mm -hmm. And I think of this in terms of what would this say to the person in their deep suffering? What would this say to the person who has fewer financial resources? What does this say to, you know, um, someone who's experienced and knows they will always be paid 72 cents on the dollar that I may be making, right? Like, how does this idea of what Jesus does, of who God is, of what sin is, of what forgiveness is mean to the people I know and love or people who I know are <laughs> living, experiencing the same world that I am, but perhaps from a different perspective. And I think it's just asking those questions. You know, we talk about when we're teaching critical thinking, it's about asking questions. And so ask the questions of what you're listening to. It's like, and the implication of that is what? And then ask if you can live with that implication. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times with religion, we take what we're being told as this is what it is, which is great if you're like four or five, right? <laughs> because you're just being introduced to something. Um, but you want to be able to say, well, is, it, is that true? Do I agree? And you might come out saying, yes, I agree. But have you asked yourself, do I agree, right? So does this sound like something I would want to tell other people? Would I tell this to the, a person I love when they are at their happiest? Would I tell this to the person I love when they're at their lowest? Right. So that's some of the measures I would think about in terms of thinking about your own faith, Christianity or any other faith, is to be to ask questions of it. And so often we're taught not to, not to question. And then that means that we're doubting or that means that we don't have a good faith system. Uh, but, you know, Tillich was very great in saying, actually, no, doubt means you take your faith seriously. <laughs> right. And this is a way of owning your own faith, not just taking on what someone has given you. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really helpful. And I, and, and I think like, if you think of where it shows up the most in American Christianity, where you avoid that critical thinking task, you avoid bringing other people's experience in, um, or, or even where you don't sit in those, the, the spaces like Adam was talking about, it's when the gospel's primarily about sin management and individual escapism. Like if that's ultimately the deal, then sitting in the trouble, like Adam suggested, or thinking of who you bring with all those things, get uh, all those experiences get collapsed to this other uh, ultimate experience uh, that, that bifurcates people not based on their own lived reality and, 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 and space in the world. Um, and yeah, anyway, but, but yeah, yeah, well. well one of the reasons why I say that also is because as we, um, and I'm talking to good process people here, we know that feeling precedes thinking, right? Like in terms of that. So a lot of times when people talk, talk about listening, listening is really, you know, it's a feeling activity first, right? Primarily. And if people feel bad about what, you know, I want to prepare people to not feel comfortable, to be comfortable, to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. I think that's a very un-American thing to do because we're always taught to run toward comfort. And I think if we do that, we kind of blunt the possibilities for change. Yeah. Right. If we always want to be comfortable in each moment. And I think part of like what Christian mission has to be, especially in, in a world of empire, is to say, look, be prepared to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Because people's lives depend on us being uncomfortable. When I say us, I include myself. Yeah. in the privileged category we're going to see things that may we not might not like or they're going to be unintended consequences they're going to be casualties of war in terms of that and we have to for other people just to live and breathe freely you know we're talking about globally so i think part of it 
part of it's also like we have to be prepared to be uncomfortable and i think we have to have resources from our traditions as ministers and as people who are in this tradition to, to say hey walk with me when my uncomfort yeah. right so that other people can live freely and flourish yeah i think that's the first step so um yeah as we're wrapping up i want to make sure monica you share everywhere to find you on the internet um, because unlike some uh, uh, brilliant systematic theologians, you make yourself available in multiple places. Uh, so, um, <laughs> can I and, ask one more thing to, to Monica? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, you know, we, we just had our um, school just opened uh, for us, last, well, this week, I should say. And I, I taught my classes for the first time on Tuesday. And one of the things they're preparing faculty for is that this is gonna be a big, this semester is gonna be a big challenge with mental health. And I know you're pretty, you know, you're, you've you been a big time, long time advocate of mental health and know a lot about that. And I was wondering if you could, before we wrap up, just, you know, I know you wrote Bipolar Faith <laughs> and you know a whole lot about mental health advocacy and wellness. And I was wondering if you had any type of words for people who are beginning the school year in terms of, and just being quarantined and locked in COVID any type of spiritual practice or any type of words of advice in terms of how to kind of survive and hang on to um, a bit of sanity and balance and wellness as they go through this for the next, um, depending on who wins the election, the next <laughs> year or three. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, this is hard because humans are meant for community, right? And, you know, what is safest from a public health perspective is the opposite of community. And so this by its very nature is difficult on people's health. And some people are not safe at home, right? And some people um, are not getting the human contact that we need on kind of a visceral species level. Um, so it's our, everyone's mental health is at stake, whatever situation you're in, that if we're not really intentional, we will not be okay. And so I would say it's that intentionality that we need to attend to. It can't, our mental health can't be an afterthought. Um, it has to, you know, if you have access to free counseling services through your school or your university, whatever, you know, seek them out before you're in really bad shape, like just preemptive, you know, <laughs> like a checkup. And there's a lot that people are doing with telehealth, a lot of more free online counseling that hasn't existed before. Um, sliding fee counseling that you can do online. I would look into that even before you think you're in a bad place, just because these are difficult situations to live in and people are losing people close to them without the rituals that we use mm. to manage our grief and loss, right? And so that's the first thing I would say. And that we have to have, everyone has to have some kind of spiritual practice that you're using to be okay. Some people that's yoga, some people that's prayer, some people that's online worship you know for some people that's journaling for some people that's like oh my god everyone's gone to sleep and i get a cup of tea at the end of the day some people that's gratitude exercises but you have to have one you have to have something because mm -hmm. i think it's about being intentional and about trying to care for our mental health while we're in really kind of a crisis state as a yeah. nation and as a globe right right okay now go to i think we had the rapture it Trip got <laughs> caught up and we are left here on earth. So I don't know what that is. <laughs> Who we left behind? <laughs> I left behind. Um, but I'll tell you where you can find me on the socials. I'm at Rev Dr. Monica, R E V D R Monica, uh, pretty much everywhere on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Pinterest. You'll see a lot of vegan food. Um, and on YouTube, I'm Rev Dr. Monica, and I'm on LinkedIn too under my name. So you can find me. I do check my DMs. I don't tweet a lot. So if you need an immediate response, don't tweet me, but I'll find it within a couple of days. Great, great. And MonicaAColeman.com. So you can always reach me through my website and sign up for newsletters. I have a free devotional. So if you want to grab the devotional, you can grab that on my website too, MonicaAColeman.com. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. We had a great conversation. Oh, he's back. The rapture didn't happen. We thought the rapture oh. happened and we were- Better they, they spit trip back out. Oh <laughs> no, no, but <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go read bedtime stories, but- uh, <laughs> Oh, it's time, yes. Oh yeah. But okay. thank you so much. Uh, I eagerly look forward to AAR not 
online so we get to see each other again. <laughs> right, like 2021, 22. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what we right? This has been so wonderful. Thanks, you all. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate you. Take care. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>